Good morning. God bless you. It's, I'm in the habit of always saying it's good to be in God's house with you. You're not here in God's house, but you're in your house, and God's in your house with you, and we're worshiping together this morning, and I'm thankful for you. Um, wanted to give us an update. I've had a lot of people asking when we're going to be opening the doors again, and my answer has always been when they let us know that we can, that it's okay to do that. It's sounding like that's going to be on the 10th of May. I don't know all the particulars of that. As we get closer, we'll, we'll be letting you know, and your deacons will be letting you know. But we're thankful for our Savior and our Lord, and I'd like to have a prayer this morning with you. Father, thank you for giving your life for us, for being our Savior, for never leaving us, for giving us the gift of your Holy Spirit when you went back to heaven to be with the Father so that we have help here in our journey and we can live for you and shine our light. And thank you for giving your life for us. And we love you. We praise you. And thank you for the ladies making all of the masks, Lord, for the nursing home and hospitals. And, and Father, be with our president and our leaders. Be with our soldiers, our firefighters, our law enforcement. Be with our hospital workers, our nursing homes, God. And, and Father... Uh, Help this virus to go away, never come back. And even more important, help this abortion to stop in our land. Help us to turn our lives back to you in this country and the truths of your word. And thank you for giving your life for us, Jesus. And fill us with your Holy Spirit. And if someone's listening to this this morning that's not sure where their eternity stands, help them to understand this morning you died for them and you want to be their Savior. You want to come into their heart forgive them of all their wrongs, all their sins, and to hold them for eternity. And thank you for this gift. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus, and we love you. Your name we pray. Amen. The title of this sermon is uh, Joy in the Lord. I was back and forth. Should it be the joy of the Lord? Or should it be the joy in the Lord? God is our joy. And uh, in this period in our country, it seems like uh, joy has evaporated out of a lot of people's lives for financial reasons, for health scare reasons, for fear. And we're going to look this morning at what God's Word says about joy. Our opening scripture is Acts 13.52. The disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Again, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding and thank you for dying for us, Jesus. Father, thank you for sending your son to pay the price for our sins. We love you. and Please speak through me this morning. And we love you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, joy is something that, uh, a feeling that we get when something good happens. It can be uh, when we get a raise at work or we get a new boyfriend or new girlfriend or or um, just uh, an opportunity that comes our way. But the circumstances of this life, if that's all there is to joy, we're going to be hollow a lot of the time. God wants us to understand this, this scripture says the disciples, that means the Christians, the followers of Jesus, those who had met him. This is after the ascension. He had promised them that there would be a gift of power through the Holy Spirit that was given. The church was born. And the Bible says that the disciples were continually filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, the joy part is a stretch for me to think, how could you constantly have joy living on this earth? I can understand it in heaven, <clears throat> but I don't understand it here. I can understand how they were continually filled with the Holy Spirit because once we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit's living inside of us always. Jesus said, I'm always with you. We can grieve the Spirit, we can quench the Spirit, but the Spirit is there. But to have the joy always there. Well, we look at the circumstances surrounding this. As I said, the church had been born two chapters earlier. We see that in Antioch, for the first time, the new believers in Christ were given a name. They were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, I don't know who started that name. I don't know who came up with it. Hey, here's what we should be called. But it was God breathed through the Holy Spirit, and it meant Christ is living inside of us. 
they had in this chapter just gotten back. Paul was saved. They had went on their first missionary journey, and they had news that the Gentiles were welcome to God as well. Everyone was welcome, and Gentiles could be saved. And so there was a continuous joy inside of them because uh, of that. And so for us as Christians, if we have the Holy Spirit, and we do if we're a Christian, there can be a continual joy that knowing every person you bump into for the rest of your life, every person is someone that Jesus died for. They may not know Christ, and they may not ever want to know him, but he died for them, and he wants to save them. And so it's thrilling to us. It's a joy in our heart that we can take that message to someone that Jesus has died for. The Bible tells us something Solomon said in Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Now, that's not capitalized in spirit there. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's our spirit. You see, you still have a spirit inside of you. You still have a flesh inside of you. And when our joyful heart, it's good medicine. It's something that we can take through the Holy Spirit. But when our spirit is not joyful, when our heart is not joyful, it's broken inside of us. When I think back a long time ago when I was into my partying days, why did I do that? It wasn't just to be popular and to have a new group of friends. It felt good. Something, though, inside of me was still missing in my spirit. I couldn't get high enough to fill that void. And only Christ can do that. Solomon went on in Proverbs 15, 13. He said, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. When our heart is sad and not joyful, our spirit's broken. Something's wrong inside of us. It can be through a broken heart of a relationship. A cheerful face, the first thing people ever see when they encounter you is your face the look on your face. They can look at your shirt, they can look at your shoes, but it's our face that is our countenance that tells a story. Now through this virus, for the first time in our country, you bump into a lot of people that have masks. Rita just brought some more up here. The girls have been making these for our hospitals and nursing homes. We're thankful. But as I go into the store or something, I see people in masks. You can't see their face, but you know what you can see? is their eyes. And even if you can't see if there's a smile on their face, you can see something in their eyes if there's fear, anxiety, or if there is some type of consolation and peace through God. Stephen, when the church was first born, he was one of the first deacons. He was martyred for his faith in Christ. And even though he was under intense persecution, the Bible says that they saw his face as the face of an angel. We want to bring joy into people's lives. We want to introduce them to Christ. Now, our story this morning that I want us to be able to see, it's a, it's a story of a father and his only son. And his only son is demon-possessed, has been that way all his life. The gospel accounts show it and cover it in in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark primarily is where we're going to look at this story this morning. But I wanted to give you a little background. Jesus had been up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. Moses and Elijah had showed up, and he was transfigured. It was a picture of his glory and who he was, and God saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And on the way down from that mountain, Jesus began to explain to Peter, James, and John, the Son of Man's going to be crucified, and he's going to rise again from the, from the dead three days later. But while they were on that mountain, this father brought his son to the rest of the disciples that were down at the bottom of the mountain. And he wanted them to be able to heal him, and they couldn't do it. They weren't able to do it. Later we see Jesus telling them it was because of prayer and fasting that this kind comes out. It was because of their unbelief or their lack of faith. 
Well, now, as Jesus comes down, there's a discussion going on between the religious leaders, the scribes, and Jesus' disciples. And it's a, it's a dispute, the Bible says. And I believe the scribes or religious leaders are saying, See, you're Jesus, whom you're naming over this demon. It doesn't work. So Jesus comes and asks them a question. What are you discussing? And the answer comes from the Father. And we see it in Mark 9, 17 through 18. One of the crowd answered Jesus, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with the spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. And I told your disciples to cast it out because you wasn't here. And they couldn't do it. We think about this son and the grief of this father having to see his son possessed from childhood, from the time he was a little boy. Never did see him right. And it broke his heart. And he believed with part of him that this person I've heard about, who he calls a teacher, and he really is the Savior, that possibly... He could heal his son. Now, Matthew and Luke's gospel, all they cover about this is, they said he came to Jesus, Jesus healed his son, cast out the demon, and gave him back to the Father. And that's the end of it. But Mark goes into much more detail. And I want us to see that because I think many times our joy and many times our pulpits preach that you bring Jesus into your life, all your problems instantly evaporate, and you're just packed with joy. We're packed with the Holy Spirit, but our problems don't evaporate till we get to heaven. This is how it went after he brought him to Jesus. Jesus answered the man in Mark 9, 19, and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. In other words, I'm not going to be here much longer on this earth. I'm going to die. I just was on the mountain. I was telling Peter, James, and John about that. And you've got to have faith. King James says, unbelieving generation. Jesus had told the disciples the reason you couldn't do this was because of your unbelief. Well, now they bring the boy to Jesus in Mark 9, 20 through 22. They brought the boy to Jesus and when he saw Jesus immediately, the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It's often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. It wants to kill him. He's put him in these convulsions all his life, but he's never been able to actually destroy him. He's never been actually to kill him. Now, you know the crowd that's standing around, they're thinking, wow, the disciples couldn't bring it out. And now Jesus comes on the scene, and immediately he goes into a convulsion. It's worsened. It's getting worse instead of better. So Jesus probably can't heal him neither. The Bible says that uh, there's a question that the Father asked Jesus in the next verses. He says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. All of us in our search for joy as a Christian need help in our belief. We need help in our faith. We need our faith increased. So the crowd's watching now. The boy's still rolling around on the ground, foaming at the mouth. It set in when Jesus came on the scene. They're thinking, he's not going to be able to do anything. And Jesus said, all things are possible to him who believes. I do believe. Help my unbelief. I believe that you can heal my son of this problem. Jesus wants to do much more intensity than that in our lives. You see, many times as we become a Christian... After we become a Christian, our boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with us. Or we lose our job. Or there's a car wreck. Or there's a sickness. Or there's cancer. And a question mark can come in our mind through Satan. 
I thought God loved you. Well, the story's not finished here yet. I want us to see the next verses. Jesus sees that a crowd's gathering. It's intense, and there's more people coming around as spectators. It says in the next verse that the crowd was rapidly gathering, and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and said to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and don't enter him again. Don't ever enter again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he's dead. Now you've got a picture of this scene. The father's there, the scribes are there, the religious leaders, the disciples are there. Some of the crowd who has never met Christ, and they're looking at this, and as soon as Jesus steps into the scene, he gets into these convulsions. Now Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit and tells it to come out and never enter again. But instead of it coming out, it goes into even worse convulsions. It wasn't until after he went into worse than terrible convulsions that it came out. And for the first time, we see the father saying, at the start of this, it often throws him into the fire in these convulsions trying to destroy him. It's never been able to destroy him, but it tries to, and now it has. He's dead. He's like a corpse. Some people look at that and say, well, he probably wasn't really dead. He was dead. You know, you might wonder with Lazarus. He loved him. He loved Mary and Martha. They came to Jesus. Brother's sick. They sent messengers. He's sick. You can help him. You can heal him. Jesus didn't go. He stayed a few days where he was at. By the time he got there, he was dead. And there was a question in Martha and Mary's mind. If you'd have been here, why did you delay? You could have saved him. There's a bigger picture that God wants to show us. There's a bigger picture here. I believe the boy had died. And the a, and a demon didn't come out right away until it threw him in worse convulsions and killed him. But the Bible says, in the next verse, Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he got up. Now, it's a different picture than what happened with Lazarus. With Lazarus, he was done in a tomb. He'd been in there for several days. They was afraid he was going to be stinking. He was in the burial clothes. Jesus took him by the hand. There is a day when Christ is coming back and he's going to take us by there and there's going to be a shout and he's going to raise us from the dead and we're going to go to heaven and be with him forever. You know, one of the heroes of the faith in my time has been a young lady named Johnny Eric Sentada. As a young girl, she dove into a pool of water, hit a rock, broke her neck, severed her spinal cord, and has been a paraplegic all her life. Terrible pain. But through that, she's kept her eyes on Christ. In the early stages of that, she was hoping she would be healed. It's never happened. But she knows Christ has not left her side, that he loves her. Luke's account says, and after Jesus raised him up, he gave him back to his father. What a joyous day. But there was a period through this when the father said, I believe, but help my unbelief. We never see the father question him. Get back away from him. He's getting worse. And now he's dead. I should have never asked you into this in the first place. Christ sees the end of the story. Many people have not met Christ. There's a song that I heard I want to play in the middle of this sermon. It's by a new artist I've never heard of her. Her name's Tasha Layton. Layton. And the title of this song is Into the Sea. Tremendous song. I want you to listen to the words. And Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit as we listen to this song. We remember that when you take us by the hand, God, to take us into heaven, it's going to be you that wipe away every tear from our eyes. And help us to never forget the price you paid. And we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. My heart is breaking In a way I never thought it With a 
question are you still good can you make something from the wreckage would you take this heart and make it whole again though the mountains may That song, Into the Sea, I like that in parentheses at the bottom, the title of the song is, It's Going to Be Okay. Somehow, through this storm of this father watching his son going through this, him asking Jesus, help my unbelief, carried him through that somehow, Jesus, it's going to be okay because you're here. And I don't see it under happening immediately. But it's going to be okay. James said in James 1, 2 through 4, Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the test in your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I was working on this sermon this week. Had put together several of the verses. Had taken a break. Had saved the file. Had come back and worked on it for about another hour, digging out the verses that I wanted to put into it, and I'm pumped up. I'm not going to get down anymore, no matter what trial, no matter what test comes. Well, I'll be doggone when I came back after taking that break. All of the verses that I rooted out somehow wasn't saved. They were gone. And I was down about it. And a hard time getting back my heart. And it wasn't for fear that I had to do another hour of work. Am I going to be able to find the verses that I wanted, that you had given me, God? And there was a stress with that. And I had to get through that. We left this morning to come into church and up by our mailbox... Someone had thrown out all kinds of trash, a whole pile of trash, just on the road. And I, who would do that? And I said, it's a little test, Rita. It's just a little test. It's just a little trial. We're not going to let our joy on the way in here to church this morning hinge that someone threw out their trash. It was the wrong thing to do. People do wrong things. 
And Rita started saying she didn't know I had this verse in there. She started, she had committed this verse to memory. And she stated it word for word. And even after that, the verse that followed was, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God, and he'll give that to you. And I said, you know what the verse is after that? It's a blank. No, I don't. I said, well, it's about wives being submissive to their husbands. I don't think that's what that says. And it doesn't right there. But uh, it was a little trial and a little test, and it was a little flub up on my part. I uh, wonder about this and this virus. Have you ever seen anything like it in your life? What God must think about us as people, some of the weird things that we begin to think in our mind, I could run out of this. I don't know how many rolls that we got stacked up. We'll go into the store early on with this, see everybody else kind of getting it, the only one package that you can get. Maybe, maybe this could get bad. Maybe we ought to put a supply in. We got enough till the Lord comes back. Of all things to run out of and be stressed about, it's amazing some of the things that we can uh, get uptight about. Now there's a verse in Psalm 98 verse 4. It says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all of the earth. Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. I like this part I put in green, break forth. I drug that around for a little while, a couple hours, after I'd lost all these verses, and it just kind of stole my joy. Break forth means to me, shake it off. Step out of it. Now as a pastor, I can tell you honestly and truthfully, my joy is not continual. It's a daily struggle and a daily decision to allow God through the Holy Spirit to bring my remembrance back and fix my eyes on Christ. To deny myself daily. We break forth and we sing for joy. This father through this storm, I believe something in his heart was beating and racing. My son is going to be okay, even though it's getting worse. This Jesus that's here told me all things are possible. And it's going to be okay. So we have trials. Sometimes we have persecutions. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 through 12, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil on you against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. Sometimes the test or the trial is persecution. Jesus said there'll be a blessing in that. Sometimes kids are teased for their faith at school. Don't let your joy evaporate. Let your joy increase and be glad. Not that you're being picked on, but you're getting it right for the Savior. So we have trials, we have persecution, and sometimes, and what we need to take a hard look at, and many churches don't want to talk at anymore, is this thing called sin. In Lamentations 5, 15 through 17, the psalmist, the, the Lamentation Jeremiah said, the joy of our heart ceased, and our dance turned into mourning. Woe to us, we've sinned. Because of this, our heart is faint. Our joy and our heart has withered up with this sin. David said after he committed adultery, when I kept silent about my sin, my body's wasting away. I've hidden it from God. Adam and Eve hid it from God. They went and hid. We are not going to have joy and be into willful sin at the same time. We've got to make a decision with that. David said in Psalm 51, 2 through 4, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me, God, from my sin. I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you and against you and you only have sinned and done what's evil in your sight. We might think, well, he sinned against Uriah and he sinned against Bathsheba. First and foremost, our sin always goes through and pierces through God's heart. Many Christians are wondering, you know, if, if, if I could just have a bigger paycheck, if I could just get a good bill of health from the doctor, my joy would return. 
We've got to let go of sin. We've got to be honest with God. The Bible says in the next verses in Psalm 51, 6 through 8, David said, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part you make me know wisdom. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. If you've been washed in the blood of Christ, live for Christ. This day and time, many people don't want to talk about the right and wrongs anymore in our country of homosexuality, of abortion, of living together outside of marriage. It's sin. It's always been sin. God's never changed the rules. He loves us. He has what's best for us. And truth is coming to God in honestly, to be honest with God. Isaiah 29, 19 says, The humble shall increase their joy in the Lord. What does it mean to be humble? Does it mean to be perfect? Only Christ was perfect. It means to be honest with God. I want you to be my master. I want to listen to you. I want to listen to the truths of your word. And I want to receive that through the Holy Spirit. And I want to obey you best I can. The Bible says when we do that, our joy is going to increase. Even though our bodies are wearing out before heaven starts. And our aches and pains and our eyes don't see as good. Pain's a terrible thing. Pain's something we can't describe. There's a lot of medications that help with pain, but there's a pain in our soul when we sin. God wants to give us relief from that. Psalm 43, 3 through 4, David said, Oh, send out your light and your truth and let them let lead me. To God, my exceeding joy, I'll praise you, oh God, my God. My God, my personal God. God wants you to know there's a personal relationship, that he loves you. There's a joy that this is not our home. This is where we share the good news with others so they can come to the home we're going to in heaven and never see hell. There's this another song out in the words say, I need you more than oxygen. You know, we've got to have oxygen to stay alive, but we need the Holy Spirit to breathe life into us. Everything in this life that we have can be gone tomorrow. Our spouses, our homes, our children, our grandchildren, all of our belongings, they can all be gone tomorrow. The only thing we're guaranteed that we can't lose is Christ, our greatest possession. It should bring a joy. David, after asking for a clean heart, he said in Psalm 51:12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Help me know and remember that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. And I'm going to get to be with you forever. Earth's not our home. It's the only home we know, though. We read about our heavenly home. God, through the Holy Spirit, wants to remind us. That's why we take the Lord's Supper, to remind us of the cost that Jesus paid to forgive our sins. In Isaiah 51, 11 through 12, it says the ransomed of the Lord will return. And they'll come with joyful shouting to Zion and everlasting joy will be on their head. They'll obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I, even I, God says, am he who comforts you. God wants a personal relationship. Obtain means to get something. The Holy Spirit wants to help us. He wants to give us a gift of joy in our lives and peace in the middle of storms. Always in our earthly mind, our fleshly mind, our joy is the size of our paycheck. It is the okay of our health. Those things can fade. God wants to give us an everlasting joy. There's a returning to the Lord. What does it mean, the ransomed of the Lord? You can insert in parentheses, the redeemed. That means those who have accepted Christ as their Savior and he's paid the price for our sins. God wants to hold us. He says, I want to comfort you. I want to hold you. The worst time in my life and the most fearful time of my life was when the doctor told me those words, you got cancer in your prostate. And then they told me it had moved up into my lung as well. And I'm not going to go into that whole story, but when I went to bed that night after hearing that news, it was the darkest day of my life. And I wasn't afraid of going to hell. I knew that if this was going to take my life, I was going to go to heaven. But I felt alone. 
And God's presence came into my life richer than I ever have. Never once whispering, I'm going to heal you and you're going to be here for a lot longer on this earth with freedom. Never told me that. Never told me the cancer was going to go away. It was his presence and there was a peace that came over me that I'd never experienced in intensity like that in my life. God tells us in Jeremiah 31, 13, I'll turn their mourning into joy and I'll comfort them and I'll give them joy for their sorrow. Many people are living in sorrow. Part of the reason is not just sin, it's that us Christians haven't done such a good job comforting other people and holding their hands because we're so busy. And we can be a self-centered person. I can be a self-centered person. David said in Psalm 1611, you'll make known to me the path of life and in your presence is fullness of joy. And intimacy with God to be in his presence, that's what I had in that room that night. I woke up the next morning, I told Rita, I said, that's what I want to give to people. She said, honey, I don't think you can. People got to want that. To not just take a ticket that we're going to heaven one day, but I want to be intimate with you in my walk. I want to know you. Many times in my life, in the past, I've treated God as a 911 God. I'll dial you up when I'm in trouble. I'm in over my head and I'm afraid I'm going to die in this car wreck or whatever. And I'll ask you for help and then I'm going to go my own way again. That's how I always treated Santa Claus. It's no way to treat God. Nehemiah 8.10, we put this verse on the sign Tim did this last week. Don't be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength or your fortress. Don't be grieved. How do we not be grieved? God knows that it grieves us when we lose a loved one. Something would be wrong with us if we didn't. But we don't stay in grief. We, we pull out of that and we have a joy return that, God, you have my loved one. This father entrusted his son while he was rolling around on the ground, foaming at the mouth, infested with this demon, into Jesus' care. We put our life into the Lord, into the joy of his strength. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 2.25, Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? He had everything. Richest man had ever lived. Wisest man had ever lived. Had horses, had more gold, more silver had all that he wanted of alcohol and drugs to stimulate his mind, had women galore, 700 wives, 300 girlfriends. It's amazing to me how he didn't go nuts right away. But he asked this question, who can eat and who can have enjoyment without God? All of these things I have. It's not filling this hole in my soul. This void that I have inside of me. None of us can have joy without God. Heard this little story. This guy's wife's credit card got stolen. A couple months later, the company calls him up and says, Sir, we got great news. We found our credit card. Husband thinks for a minute. He looks at it and says, Well, tell the thief to keep it. He spends a whole lot less than my wife ever did. I don't know about it. You know, you don't, <laughs> I can see Tim smiling back there, but there's nobody here to laugh. It's not a laughing matter if we don't have God in our life, though, and we're not going to have enjoyment. You cannot get contentment. You cannot get satisfaction. Oh, there were little pieces and little mountaintops in there when I was smoking pot and doing drugs, drinking. They call it getting high. But you don't stay up there. And even when you're at the top and you're the highest, there's something crawling around inside of you that's missing, and it's God's presence. The Bible tells us in Psalm 94, 14, Satisfy in the us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Now at the first glance, it's some kind of a spiritual morning pill that we take, and then for the rest of our days, we're packed with joy. There's a decision. 
every day to enter into a relationship to start your day off with God and with his loving kindness. He wants you to know how much he loves you. It's our daily bread. Jesus said in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. It's abundant life. We talk about that a lot in this church. Now these things that he's spoken to us are written down. And they're there for us. And the Bible tells us that it is our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It is God's spiritual nourishment, but he'll never force that on us. Many people go to church. Many people are going to listen to this. They're not going to open their Bible this week. And no matter how many times I go over it to do that, the cemeteries are full of Christians that go through their whole life and never get grounded in God's word. And it's not something that we just open when we're in trouble. God wants to speak to you every day. John wrote and recorded these words that Jesus said, and John turned around in 1 John 1, 4, and said, these things we write to you that your joy may be made full. The privilege that they had of being with Jesus, two of the closest being John and Peter, we get to write these things, breathe through the Holy Spirit to tell you about Jesus. We've written down what he said. We want you to read about our experiences and what we saw with him. I want to tell you about this father that had this son that was rolling around and things got worse even when Jesus was there to the point that he died. But he gave us a picture that he's coming back and he's going to raise us from the dead. Peter wrote about it after he denied the Lord. He said in 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, Though you haven't seen him now, you love him. And though you don't see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul, the part that no doctor, no antibiotic, no mask, no ultrasound can heal our soul. What does it mean to have salvation of our souls? It means to accept Christ as our Savior. And we love him for that. And there's a joy that's inexpressible. People tell, how do you feel about the Lord? He's my Savior. He's my first love. And I want that to increase. And I've got to keep that in place every day. Doesn't mean that I lose my salvation. But if I get away from God's word, I'm going to get spiritually anemic. You know, if you don't eat today, you're not going to die. You're not going to fall over dead, kick the bucket. But you're going to get weak and you're not going to feel so good. If you don't eat tomorrow, you're going to get weaker yet. If we don't have our spiritual food and we get it once a week at church, doesn't mean we can't go to heaven. But we're not going to be spiritually strong. We're not going to have this joy inside of us. As Jesus began to talk to John and the disciples, I'm going to be leaving soon. I'm going to go to this cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to come back. He was here for 40 days and then he ascended. They began to be grieved over that. And Jesus told them these words, and I love these words. It's John 16, 22. As John recorded his words, he said, Jesus said, I'll see you again. And your heart will rejoice. And no one's going to take your joy away from you. Now that's a picture of heaven when we see Christ and he comes back. That God wants to give us joy here. And it is what his word brings into our life. Isaiah 55, 11 through 12 talked about it. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. God's word. What does God want to desire to accomplish in your life? He wants us to be a spokesman. He wants us to share the good news. We talked about this just about every Sunday. He doesn't want everybody to be a preacher. There's preachers out there that God never wanted to be a preacher. 
There's deacons that God never called to be a deacon. But God wants to accomplish something in our life, and he has a desire for your life, and it's for others to go to heaven. And he wants to give us peace, and it comes through his word. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and a delight in my heart. For I've been called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Now, when I saw that as a kid, I always thought, I wonder how I felt after he chewed all them pages up in that paper and the cover off a, of a Bible. It's not what he's talking about. He didn't physically eat pages. It's about our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It's our spiritual nourishment. And it becomes a joy and a delight of my heart. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I read the Bible every day, morning, and I read it before I go to bed at night. Haven't missed that for 30-some years. And sometimes I just do it because I'm supposed to. The main reason I want to stay in that is because it wounds God's heart if I don't. God wants fellowship with us. And he tells us as we open his word, and one of the joys in our heart, he's been, we've been called by his name. Now we started this sermon out, and we're going to finish it today. What does it mean to be called by his name? I'd love to know the history, and the Bible doesn't tell us, it just tells us that the first time the believers in Christ, the ones that believe that Jesus died, the first time they were called Christians was at Antioch. It's in the 11th chapter of Acts. Now who came up with that name? I don't know. I don't know if it was one of the disciples. I don't know if it was a new believer. I don't know if the church had met and had a little business meeting about it, but it was God breathed, and the name meant Christ in us. And we have been called a Christian if we're saved and Christ lives in us. But as we look out and every person we meet, all of them is not Christians. How do we take the Christ in us and put it inside of someone else? You see, that's what we're being called to do. The more I read in the Bible, that's our mission. Many times people get into religious arm wrestling. There was religious arm wrestling about circumcision. You've got to be circumcised to be saved. It's the gospel. It's the good news. But you can't force it inside. You can't take it out of you and force it into someone else. But we can hold their hand and we can love them. We can pray for them. Proverbs 12:25. Solomon said, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Anxiety. People are filled with anxiety through this virus. They're hoping their joy is lost. They believe as a Christian they're going to heaven, but they're worried. Anxiety is worried. Jesus talked about it many times. A good word, the great word, God wants to speak to you so that you can speak to someone else. A good word is a kind word, a loving word. It doesn't have to be every time Jesus loves you. If you don't accept him, you're going to hell. There's time to get around to that. But it's, I love you. Is there something I can do for you? You know, the greatest word that ever came that man heard was breathed through an angel. And it comes, and it's our closing verse. It's in Luke 2, 10 through 11. The angel said to them, who were the shepherds, the outcasts, never an occasion to be met by God or welcomed to God, don't be afraid. Behold, I'm bringing you good news of great joy, and it's for all the people. For today in the city of David has been born for you a Savior, and he's Christ the Lord. It's Christ. And he wants to give you that new name. He wants to live inside of you. It's the greatest news ever. And it's never changed. And it never will change. It's the way of salvation. It's a free gift. You see, these shepherds, these Gentiles. It's why there was a joy inside of the disciples continually. That It's for the Gentiles too. When we go out the doors, it's not just for the Jews. 
It's for all people. It's a great blessing, and it restores our joy. It's the greatest joy ever. And when we begin to look out, even in spite of this virus and this sinful world that we live in, there's good news for people. They can go to heaven. God loves us. What does it mean, a Savior? They didn't understand the Christ. They thought he was someone that was going to deal with the Roman oppression. To save us from our sins, the angel said. And Father, thank you for the gift. And I can only read about it in your word. We don't understand what you went through as your son hung on that cross and you watched him die for our sins. You loved him. But you loved us and you wanted us to be able to come to heaven through him. And we are so grateful for that gift. And help us to have a joy in our heart and help us to understand all people, this gift is for all people, but all people don't know the good news. Help us in our short little stay here on this earth to come to you and ask for compassion, to come to ask for a burning desire, to not just read your word, but to be a doer of your word, to obey you, to take sin serious, to understand it hurts your heart and we're to love you. And thank you for giving your life for us and help us be able to open our doors soon and to worship you again. And thank you for dying for us, Jesus, and we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Now we're going to have a closing prayer for those of you who may not know Christ. You may not know what it means and how you accept this Savior. God is never interested in fancy words or sentences or clothes or suits and ties. What he's interested in is humility, sincerity. Do I mean the words? Do I realize I'm lost? Do I want to know you as Savior? I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Father, I come to you and I admit that I've done things wrong and the Bible calls that sin. And I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. And I believe that that forgiveness comes through the cross. That you did die on that cross, Jesus. And you rose from the dead to pay the price in full for all that I've ever done wrong. Please come into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior and help me to love you and follow you and not pick and choose which words I want to obey in, in, your, in your word, but to, to be faithful to you and to love you and thank you for dying for me, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. If you have a, a need, call me or call your deacon. Hopefully we're going to be opening our doors real soon. And God bless you, and I love you, and I'm thankful for you. Spend time in God's Word. If you don't have a Bible, you call me, 392-2140, and I will hand deliver one to you so that you can read about God's heart. I love you, and God bless you, and hallelujah. <laughs>